Okay, so <clears throat> this presentation is about the three cauldrons of the Irish Celtic uh, Bardic tradition. Now, I first encountered them back in 2008. I was invited to a workshop on Celtic shamanism, and I hadn't heard of the three cauldrons before. Uh, when they were explained to me, they were very familiar because I'd already had eight years experience of uh, Chinese martial arts and they use the three cauldrons for their science, if you like, but their approaches are very different. Um, before I go into that, I just want to show you a couple of books. <clears throat> There's these two books. The first one is by John and Kathleen Matthews. Okay. Now, in 2008, this was the book I was shown to explain the three cauldrons to me because I hadn't heard of them before. And the teacher that was giving the class recommended this book. Yeah. Now, the three cauldrons come from a 15th century Irish manuscript that was found almost by accident in some legal papers. They were kind of shoved, shoved in some legal documents. So they're not a finished work in themselves. They're not a book, for instance. And in English uh, translation, they amount to barely four pages, the, the four pages of poetry, really. But they are authentic Celtic 15th century, late medieval bardic law. And they explain how for uh, a bard that has achieved their highest skills, what it is like having these three cauldrons activated within the body. So it's almost explaining to students, this is what it will feel like. Now, simplistically, uh, the lower cauldron is your pelvic bowl, simplistically. Your middle cauldron is your chest and heart and lungs, everything inside your ribs. And your upper cauldron is your head. Now it's much more, has much more finesse than that. Um, and it is really metaphysical uh, aura, psychical energy rather than your physical body. Um, so the, the 14th, the 15th century, prose about them uh, just explains what it feels like to have those cauldrons doing their job and but there is no how to do it in any of the writing so it's a really frustrating enigma and it leaves modern bards and druidic type people to figure out how to do it for themselves now <clears throat> In the John and Kathleen Matthews book, there's a diagram there of the three cauldrons. I see the one at the bottom is upright. There's one to the side is on its side. And the one at the top is facing downwards. But they're actually within the body. So it's kind of like the pelvis area, the chest and the head. Now, this is just um, poetic metaphor but this is how it's explained really in a simplified way. The lower cauldron for everybody is upright and it holds your vital force or your life force and so on. And it's upright all the time for everybody. But what's interesting then is the poetic metaphors that the middle cauldron is a cauldron on its side for the Irish tradition. Now, as being on its side means it can flip to go downwards or it can flip to go upwards. And it's a kind of acknowledgement that the middle cauldron has this very changeable uh, way of being, if you like. Now, if you're broken hearted and upset, it turns downwards. And if you're full of love and happiness and joy, it turns upwards. So it's almost a poetic metaphor for emotional state of being. And for all of us throughout the day, it can go up and down all day long sort of thing, you know. So, but the thing that the 
Irish bards were trying to do was to work on the upper cauldron. So for most people, apart from the very enlightened bards, the upper cauldron is down. It's facing down all the time. And to turn it upwards is when you get inspiration and divine poetry and inspired song and stuff. So the bardic approach was working on the middle bowl to try and turn it upwards so that the upper cauldron could turn upwards and get inspired poetry and so on. So in a way you cannot get the inspiration or the imbus or the arwen when the upper cauldron is down, you know? Um, so simplistically, and it's not wrong that it's down, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, simplistically then, the, the Celtic Irish approach to the three cauldrons was focusing on the top cauldron and, and trying to turn it upright to get the inspiration, the poetic inspiration, the, the, the divine light of spirit, if you like, you know, that would give you a radiant brow. Now, being there in the class as a student for this, but having eight years experience at that time with um, Qi Gung and Tai Chi, I recognized it all as what in Tai Chi and Qi Gung schools are referred to as the three Dantians. And even a lot of uh, Qi Gung people uh, don't really talk about the middle or the upper Dantian. Most, um, martial art focus is on the lower cauldron. Uh, the, the lower cauldron from the Qigong Tai Chi perspective is all about uh, developing your Qi, storing your Qi, building up your battery. Uh, and so, and also then all physical movements, every physical movement is driven from the lower Dantian. So a lot of the focus is on the lower cauldron for storing your energy and for being the center point of every movement that you do. But with the standing meditations and, and other aspects of Qigong, the middle Dantian and the upper Dantian or the middle cauldron and the upper cauldron are equally important. But for beginners and students, the focus is on the lower cauldron, lower Dantian. So I was sitting there in 2008 and uh, hearing all about the three cauldrons and just realizing that it is exactly the same, really, as the Chinese knowledge. And that really excited me at the time because it's I'm fascinated that wisdom of the West and wisdom of the East can come together uh, as one whole thing, really, you know, the best of East and West. Now, the bardic thing is really interesting and it's worth trying to get hold of a translation of it if you like i know of two the very first translation of the irish manuscript in english was by a lady called annie power a double n i e power like superpower and she called it the cauldron of posy so you can google that if you just google the Cauldron of Posy by Annie Power. That's the first English translation about the three cauldrons. And again, it's not enough for a whole book. It amounts to about four pages, but you can read for yourself the rather surreal and obscure poetic descriptions. It's like any Welsh poem credited to Taliesin. You know, it's not clear what they're even saying, but they are referring to these methods of understanding these cauldrons within the body. Um, the version, the translation that I'm more used to is Kathleen Matthews' uh, own translation in this book. So she retranslated it and then wrote quite a few pages. About, she turned it into about 20 pages discussing uh, her insights uh, about the, the, the cauldron of posy. Now, From a Qigong perspective then, uh, a few books that I've seen 
talking about the three cauldrons uh, relate it to a process that people would be familiar with if they're familiar with um, reflexology or acupuncture, because it's to do with the energy field of the body and so forth. And there is a function in the body called the triple warmer or the triple heater. And that's often confused with the three dantians or the three cauldrons. But just to clarify, the triple heater isn't the three cauldrons. The triple heater is a process within the body uh, related to the digestive system and the body's metabolism. And the triple heater process all happens between the middle cauldron and the lower cauldron. So it, it's all to do with uh, you know, your base chakra holding things and your, your intestines and the digestive nurse of food and how that sends uh, nutrition to the liver and the kidneys. It, so it's a complicated thing in itself, but it isn't the three cauldrons because the third cauldron is the head, of course, which is above and not part of the triple warmer, although they're all related. Now, <clears throat> So, uh, cut, cutting it really simple then, uh, when I was planning this talk, uh, I thought it would be quite easy. And, and then I realized, no, it's not going to be easy. And, and the reason for that is really to give any justice to the whole thing. You, you really need to, you could have a Zoom session just on the lower cauldron. It's that simple. You could have one on the middle cauldron and one on the upper, but to try and do justice to the whole thing in one session, it's, it's not really possible. So this is more like an overview, if you like, and I would rather share insights that I've got where I've seen it, the, the same pattern expressed in different cultures. And I think that's really important because I think we're at a really exciting and interesting time. Now, the reason is that, you know, from the Celtic, roots, if you like, we know there is this authentic perspective of three cauldrons. And from that, you can then look at all of the different Celtic stories that talk about cauldrons. And you can start to try and figure out, are they talking about the lower, the middle or the upper, or all three in one, you know, th th those ideas are there. Um, but like I said, the problem with the, the original Celtic manuscript is it doesn't tell you how to do it. It only tells you what it feels like when you're in a, an advanced bard. So looking at other traditions then, um, the most common approach to the three cauldrons that I've seen in kind of Celtic shamanic schools is, is simply to be shamanic about it, you know, so to treat the three cauldrons like uh, places that you can work with shamanically, like the lower world, the middle world, and the upper world. And you can do that. You could have a drumming session and actually have a journey to your lower cauldron or your middle cauldron or your upper cauldron. So that's probably the most simplistic approach, if you like. And then the, the other extreme is something like Qigong, where there are thousands and thousands of Qigong exercises and, and the complexity of understanding the body from an acupuncture kind of perspective to understand the meridians and energy lines throughout the body. You can get as complicated as you want with it, really. Um, but having said that, that's not a criticism. And I think it's really important that, you know, you can take the wisdom and insights from Chinese Taoist uh, practices to then apply them to Druidic Celtic insights uh, and bring the two together. For instance, most Qigong, in fact, all of them really, should have at their core the correct posture and activation of the lower cauldron because there are no health benefits from an exercise unless the lower cauldron is correctly held and the posture of the body is correctly held. So on one hand, Shamanically, you could just lie down on the floor with a blanket and someone drumming for you, and you could do a visualization to the lower cauldron, and that's fine. But from a more dynamic energy point of view, you can stand 
in a qigong posture and actually activate the energy and store the energy into the cauldron you know which then rises up your spinal cord to your middle bowl and your upper bowl and to your pineal gland and stuff so there's something to be gained from each school of insight now my own book here then i'm just going to flick out a few, few few things i have done a a small chapter on the three cauldrons. And what I will do, uh, I'll try and do it over the next week ahead, is I'll turn it into a free PDF file. Uh, for the group, and then it can go on the files section. Now, <clears throat> that idea of the lower bowl being upright, and the middle bowl, middle bowl being on its side and the upper bowl being down is really important. And, and for first of all, it's Kabbalistic. But this could have been an island as an influence uh, well into the 12th century. So the tr traditional tree of life design, which also represents a human body. You know, there's the Kabbalistic man idea that this actually relates to the heart and chest and head of an individual sort of thing. So the upper bowl is downward, just like the Irish thing says that it's downward. And the aim from Kabbalistic things, and certainly in the Western magical tradition, if not uh, authentic Orthodox Judaism, um, there's this pursuit of ascending spirituality, if you like, or getting up to the top of the tree to the source of unlimited light, uh, uh, infinite light, but the top is downward. And there's a sphere that is very abstract and difficult for people to get their heads around and it's called Darth. And apparently most people that climb the tree of life fail at Darth and fall all the way back down again and have to start all over again. Metaphors, whatever, you know, but the idea, the ideal, the perfect achievement would be to turn it upwards and then you're receiving the divine light of spirit. So that's exactly the same as the Irish bards trying to turn their cauldron up and get the divine light. Now, um, one way of looking at this is like an egg. So I'm just going to move back a bit and show you my hands. So the top bowl is upside down, the lower bowl, the right way up, if you like, but they're like an egg. And the middle bowls in the middle between them. Um, and this kind of closed egg, or the upper cauldron down is not a bad thing. It's kind of your firewall. It's your self preservation, if you like, it's your cocoon. Um, you could not function as a human being if you were permanently receiving light from the spirit world. You just couldn't, you know? The, the upper bowl flicks upwards and then it goes back down to being this hermetically sealed egg, you know? And so you can kind of recognize it metaphorically. Uh, say if someone's totally broken hearted, so their middle bowl is upside down, and they're devastated by life, then they have this kind of closed in thing and the, the eyes are dead. There's no light in the eyes and they're just shut. And you might have to be like that for a few weeks, months or years whilst you sort out your inner stuff. But when you're happy again, it will turn up again and, and you'll, you'll shine with vitality and spirit and happiness and stuff. So these are the kind of ideas with that. Now, those moments of pure light and inspiration from the spirit world. Um, yeah, you could not function like that. You know, there, there's something you do, you have a meditation to gain an insight, but then you have to carry on functioning in the real world. <clears throat> now, another thing, this really interests me. I don't know if you'll see this very well. <clears throat> so, this picture, and I'll put it on the group. So this is from Hadrian's Wall, and it's from fourth century Roman Britain, you know? 
Now, it represents the god Mithras um, bursting forth. But if you look carefully, he's coming out of an egg. There's a, the lower part of the egg below his torso, and almost like a hat on his head is the upper part of the egg. It's like he's being born from the cosmic egg or sort of thing. Now, around him, let me can see, he's holding a sword and he's pointing at the space between uh, Gemini and Cancer, the crab. Now, that is the summer solstice. So with the sword, he's pointing at the summer solstice. And above his head are Leo and Cancer, the crab, which is the sun and the moon. Now, it'd be easier to see in a PDF file, but what that gives you is a chakra system going down through the spine of the body. So the, the head with its left brain and right brain corresponds with the sun and the moon. But then as you come down to the throat, it all corresponds with Mercury and then to Venus and then Saturn, Jupiter, and then at the lower cauldron, Saturn. So going back to the ancient world, of Rome and Greece, there were only seven planets, but they managed to create a chakra system with it. Now, of course, that's reminiscent of the Hindu chakra used in yoga, uh, which is the three cauldrons too, actually, because the, the two lower chakras are the lower cauldron. So your root chakra and your sacral chakra are the lower cauldron. Uh, the middle cauldron is gonna be a solar plexus and your heart chakra. And the upper cauldron is your throat and your third eye. And the seventh chakra, the crown chakra, is actually above the head. It's not in the head, you know. So it amounts to two chakras, two chakras, two chakras, or three cauldrons. And then the light or the crown chakra above it shining down into it, just like the Kabbalistic tree receiving the light or an upturned cauldron receiving light or an enlightened yogi radiant in their crown chakra. It was all the same stuff, really. So that's different cultures all saying the same thing, but maybe breaking it down differently to teach ideas to their students. Now, <clears throat> this next diagram is the same diagram from Hadrian's wall, but I've turned the figure sideways. So instead of him looking at you waving a sword around, he's just turned sideways. Now, what that gives you is where he was pointing to summer solstice with his sword corresponds with the back of the neck. And that is actually, so summer solstice at the back end of the neck and down by his groin is the winter solstice, okay? So there's this idea of energy rising up the spinal cord to the neck and the pineal gland and then descending back down to the lower regions. Very, very basic. Nowadays, we would say uh, coming up the central nervous system, it's a spinal cord. The central nervous system is your spine and your pineal gland um, inside your brain. And then down, not back down the spine, but up the central nervous system and down through the peripheral nervous system. So it's like a tree. You know, the spine is your tree trunk, and then your peripheral nervous system is all the smaller nerve endings going down to your fingers and toes. I think. But it's the same thing. So now here, look, this is a traditional Taoist uh, diagram. Now, you see it corresponding with the back of the neck, there's a white circle. That's pure yang or summer solstice. And corresponding with the groin, groin is a black circle, a winter solstice or yin. And I don't know if you can see it, but in the body, there's a kind of cauldron in the lower belly. There's a flaming heart in the chest. And then there's an interesting diagram in the middle of the brain. Sort of thing. But it's all the same law, if you like. Now, so what have we got then? We've got the Celtic law of three cauldrons. <clears throat> You've got the Qigong Chinese perspective of energy in the body. You've got Roman legionaries on Hadrian's wall, also dividing the body into a chakra system that corresponds with the Hindu chakras. And in the ancient world, 
Rome and Greece and Alexandria, the zodiac was used uh, to explain processes in the body as well. For instance, very simplistically, the feet correspond with Pisces and the head corresponds with Aries and things like that. And, and it can get more complicated than that, but every zodiac sign corresponds with a part of the body. Now, here's a funny thing. Um, with Qi Gung, the main thought is moving Qi around the body. Qi uh, can simplistically just mean energy. And that's a very vague term. For instance, we use the word energy in a very vague way. Now, we can talk about energy, and you don't know what energy I'm talking about. I could be talking about electricity in a light bulb, but I could equally be talking about the energy carbohydrates give you when you eat potatoes. You know, so there's different types of energy and qi is like that in China. So they will actually get pedantic and say liver qi, kidney qi, heart qi. You know, there's all sorts of different qis. So it's just cheese, like cheese, not cheese. But um, yeah. Um, but here's a the thing then, and this is really tantalizing. And it could be wisdom spread along the silk route a long time ago. So uh, as I understand it, the old Chinese hieroglyph writing for Qi represented either the sun or fire. And the kind of implication was heat, if you like, uh, or internal sunshine. Um, now in, in modern Chinese, it, it doesn't represent sun or fire. There is much more complicated <clears throat> a diagram. It actually represents three grains of cooked rice with the steam rising up. But again, it's this kind of heat, this rising steam or internal heat, if you like. Now, uh, fire is often used to represent the life force, quite simply because a cold body is a dead body. So a living body has heat in it, as simple as that, really. Now, going back to zodiac or star law, um, the three fire signs in the zodiac are the three cauldrons. Aries, the fire sign Aries, the ram, is the head. The fire sign of Leo the lion is the heart. And the fire sign of Sagittarius, the archer, is the thighs. Now it's the thighs that create the heat or the chi or the spiritual fire of the body and that's what qi gung tries to do if you like but it's really interesting that the three fire signs each correspond uh with the three cauldrons if you like so three different fires so you could look at it from an astrological perspective that the fire of the head is related to aries with its ram's horns and the fire of the heart is to do with Leo the lion and its star law, and, and the fires of Sagittarius are, are the lower cauldron. Now, each of those corresponds with very esoteric star patterns, which some of you might be familiar with. So for instance, Aries is part of the uh, sun cross. In simple terms, that means that the cross of winter solstice, summer solstice, spring equinox, autumn equinox, the sun cross is the head. That kind of division of the year into two halves or four quarters is Aries. And uh, more interesting from a Celtic perspective is that the middle cauldron star law of Leo is what's called the royal star cross. And that's Aquarius opposite Leo, Scorpio opposite Taurus, but in Celtic terms, that's Imbolc, Beltane, Lunasa, Sawain, all in the middle cauldron because they belong to the Leo star law pattern. And really interesting then is the final four zodiac signs belong to the Sagittarius lower cauldron. And that's what I call the deep. That's Pisces opposite Virgo, Sagittarius opposite Gemini. And that's all to do, to do with death and rebirth, soul, passages to the Milky Way or poetic bardic stuff, it's the well where the salmon of wisdom are, 
Pisces is the salmon of wisdom. So all of that metaphor of the poetic salmons of wisdom is in the lower cauldron. It's there, and that's the, the, the root or the source that feeds into the middle and upper cauldrons. So there's so much there. Now, um, right. <clears throat> that's just an overview. That's all there was time for, really. But we'll talk about some of those ideas shortly. So what I would like to do before we have our discussion is just from a Qigong perspective then, and there, there isn't time to really teach Qigong here right now, but these core, this core principle of activating the lower cauldron is something that can be explained and you can just go off and you can just do it. It's simple as that. And it's simply a way of standing in a correct way to energize your thighs Sagittarius, the fire sign, the lower cauldron is the thighs. And your thigh bone is your biggest bone in the body. And the Chinese use metaphors like uh, wringing out the thigh bone. You know, it, it is a bit of, it, sh it should be a little bit tiring because your thighs are holding your body weight for one minute or two minutes or three minutes or however long you want to do it, really. But what's really going on is the heat being generated by your thighs is building up your chi, building up your battery. And the longer you can hold a posture, the more your spine can relax. Now, if your spine can relax and each vertebrae begins to, with gravity, just separate from the other vertebrae a little bit, they say like a string of pearls just hanging down, you're liberating your spinal cord just by standing properly. You know, and this is your tree trunk, this is your central nervous system. And along the spine, there are three gateways. The lower gateway con corresponds with the lower bowl, middle gateway, middle bowl, upper gateway, upper bowl sort of thing. But if your spine is stiff or tight or tired, <clears throat> all of that energy flow in your body is going to be restricted, you know. So whether it's just meditating or standing like a druid next to a tree to commune with the tree energy you want your spine liberated you want the energy to flow up and down your spine and tingle your pineal gland okay so the way to do that without demonstrating it is to stand with your feet the shoulder width apart okay so it feels like the balls of your feet are under your armpits you're looking for a parallel line between the armpits to your hips to your knees to your ankles now your feet are just parallel they're not turned outwards or turned inwards so parallel in the body parallel feet about a shoulder width apart and then once you've got that kind of alignment you just want to bend your knees a little bit not lots it's not a big squat you're just off locking the knee now here's the thing we all tend to be lazy and uh, I've even seen teenagers be awkward with their bodies. You must be able to wiggle your toes. Sounds really silly, but you must wiggle your toes. And it's simply this. If you cannot wiggle your toes, your knees are holding you and you're going to get knee pain eventually. Okay, So when you're standing still, you must be able to wiggle your toes. And that means most of your body weight is gonna go down through your heels into the ground. Now, it's all about balance. So not completely in the heels or your fall backwards, but most of your body weight is in your heels and you can wiggle your toes. And if you held that for two minutes or three minutes, you would feel it in your thighs. Your thighs would start to get a bit warm, uh, a little bit tired, you know? Um, and that's because the thighs are holding your body weight rather than your knees holding your body weight. So then it's just a comfort zone for you. You know, um, dedicated Qigong people will stand for a whole hour. That's hardcore. It's very difficult to do. But you could easily stand for four minutes, five minutes. Now, in, in, 
in my experience, something magical happens after about eight minutes. That's an average. Uh, it's different for each individual. But roughly speaking, if you can hold it for eight minutes and just let your thighs hold you and you just relax your body weight into the ground through your heels, after about eight minutes, the spine starts to relax. When it knows that the thighs are holding you, the spine relaxes. Trouble is, by that time, your legs are getting tired. You know, so say you stood for 10 minutes, you'd only have had about two minutes benefit, you know, because it would be eight minutes just relaxing the spine sort of thing. Hence why dedicated Qigong people do an hour, but they've worked up and they've made themselves strong legs, you know. Uh, but it's something to aim for. But it was perfectly okay to lie down on the floor and do a shamanic journey or sit in a chair and do a meditation, but you're not activating the lower cauldron. But only by working the thighs are you activating the lower cauldron, you know. But it's just gently, gently. You could do two minutes a day, three minutes a day, four minutes a day. It's just standing still, you know, but in an intelligent way. And so you settle down, body weight into the heels, relaxing the spine, and the thighs are cooking in that heat then. If you stood for a long time, say half an hour, you'd start to sweat. You know, you'd actually have sweat dribbling down your forehead and yet you're not moving around, you know, because there is heat going on there. You're working, even though it's standing. Something. So that's how you activate the lower cauldron uh, and the well-being of the middle cauldron and the upper cauldron depend upon the lower cauldron. You know, so the fantasy about the Druids spending 20 years in the forest, I bet they weren't sitting down all the time. I bet they did some standing, you know, I'm sure they did. Um, <clears throat> right, we're finished there, a little bit earlier than I thought, um, but that gives us a bit more time for talking and, and sharing ideas then. So you can turn your microphones back on. Brilliant. Thank you. Oh, could only really be much of an overview. But uh, maybe this half hour question thing can shed light for people as well. Thank you, Yuri. That was a really interesting talk. It's my first time meeting yourself and everybody, everybody else. Um, I'd not heard of the three cauldrons before until I saw your diagram on the Facebook group. But I kind of do my own sort of nature ritual practice where I kind of connect with nature and the reason it resonated as soon as I saw it was in my, in my own body, I'd felt those three, I wasn't naming cauldrons, but I felt those three energy centers. So I guess something I wanted to contribute is that my feeling is that we, we all hold that wisdom in our own bodies and actually connecting with particular parts of our bodies, the heart, the intestines, different parts. Our bodies can speak to us a little bit about about the wisdom that they hold for yes. us. I should have mentioned what each cauldron is called in Irish. Um, I'm not going to try and pronounce the Irish because it would be an insult to the Irish people, but, but in English, the lower cauldron is translated as the cauldron of warming. And that's interesting with chi and heat and, and the kind of vitality in the body, if you like. So it's more just like energy well-being. The, the middle cauldron is, is probably the most complex of all of them, uh, and it translates as the cauldron of vocation. And vocation is all about your purpose and your heart's calling and your heart's desire, and are you living the life you came here to do? And so when I talked about <laughs> it going up and down, depending <laughs> on happy or sad, uh, Happy or sad is whether you're doing what you're meant to be doing and you're content or not, and all of those kinds of things, you know. So it's worth meditating on what is your vocation because your middle cauldron will not be content unless you're following your vocation. Yeah. And then the, third, the upper cauldron translates as cauldron of knowledge, but I would retranslate it because it's, it's not knowledge just like, you know, 
even the most um, unenlightened person can learn stuff and remember it. It's not that kind of knowledge, you know. It's more like what the Greeks call gnosis. Uh, gnos gnosis is about divine knowledge of your higher self or eternal self or spirit self and stuff. So I, I would say, yeah, you know, cauldron of gnosis rather than cauldron of knowledge. So when it's down, it's just the mundane you. And when it's upwards, the upper cauldron, then you're what in Welsh is called taliesin, you know, the radiant brow is there, it's shining, it's full of the light is coming through. So I, think, I only learned today, I'd never heard this before, but um, everyone says third eye from the chakras, uh, from yoga uh, and or the pineal gland. I usually just say pineal gland. And what I learned today is that the Chinese call it the third eye translated in English, they call it the sky eye, as in the sky where the clouds are and the sun. So it's this kind of sky eye. And, and when it's activated, that's when you get psychism and visions and dreams uh, and so on and so forth. So it, it is like the bridge, the imaginal bridge between you and the spirit world. So, but if you're broken hearted or upset and angry, you can't do that, you know, you're just there. But when you're in a better place and tranquil, then you can see through your sky eye. So do you think that by practicing, this is just a, not that this is the only way, but that if you practice the stance of feeding the lower cauldron, that that will restore seership like you know i don't even quite know how to say it i mean it depends how far gone the damage is in the body you know a gunshot wound is a gunshot wound um but simplistically uh, from a chinese medicine perspective they see the heart as pumping blood around the body but they see the kidneys as pumping chi around the body now, these are old metaphors. We would now understand it differently. We would now talk about adrenaline and fight or flight mode and, and all that sort of thing. So if, if you're in fear and panic, you're, your digestive system shuts down because it just wants you to run away from danger sort of thing. Um, so these are, and if you're on a battlefield, you can't rely on your adrenaline. It doesn't last long enough. It runs out after 20 minutes. So you, you'll be burnt out and dead. You know, so whether it's the Roman legionaries on Hadrian's Wall or Chinese warriors, if you're in a battle, you have to breathe slowly to last. It's as simple as that, you're, or you'll burn out. But that's the health benefits that it gives to everybody in the modern world. You know, the slower you can breathe, the healthier you're going to be, because the slower you breathe, you're no longer in fight or, fright or flight, you know. So your digestive system will start working properly and, and, and your body will start repairing itself properly because you're not in fight or flight sort of thing, you know? Um, so they say with uh, Tai Chi, it just balances people out. It makes uh, overweight people slimmer. It makes skinny people heavier. You know, it just kind of, it balances you out into the yin and yang thing of equal harmony that is just balanced inside. And with such a frightened, fearful, stressful, anxious world, you know, that we just have so many worries and that we're all a little bit on edge. So whether it's yoga or Tai Chi or just walking in the woods, if you can just slow your breathing down and no longer be frightened, you're going to start getting better. Simple as that, because the body will function properly. So back to those diagrams. Uh, when you're standing in, an, in a, an intelligent way, and if you can't stand because you've got handicap, then just sit upright in a chair, you know? So you might not have legs that can cope with the standing. So just sit upright rather than slouched. Um, and as you breathe in slowly, energy comes from your winter solstice lower regions up your central nervous system to your pineal gland. So that's all one breath. So it goes like this. 
And at the end of the breath, there's just a little pause in the pineal gland. And now I'm going to begin exhaling. Just breathe out slowly and it's settling back down. And when it's gone back down to the nether regions between my legs, another little pause. And then a breathe in again up the spine. And this is so, uh, so much like the year. So at, at winter solstice, there's three day standstill. It's like a pause. Mm -hmm. And at summer solstice, there's three day standstill. It's like a pause. So the breath's the same. You know, the winter solstice is all the energy down in the lower cauldron. And as you breathe in, that's in bulk and spring equinox, and it's rising up your spine to summer solstice is when your pineal gland goes, you know, <laughs> three days standstill, and then it just autumn back into winter, settling back down under the ground again. So these are very seasonal, organic, natural rhythms as well, you know. And so you just, the slower you can breathe, the better you will be health-wise because your digestive system will start working and so on. Y Yori, um, hi, good to hi, see Andy. you. Um, um, you know, with the, the kidney thing you were mentioning, like the kidneys being the chi pumps, if you will. And um, yeah, I guess I was, I was wondering, you know, what, what's a good way of... Um, you know, really looking after your kidneys, obviously, apart from obvious things like not drinking and stuff like that. And, but, you know, is there any, any any specific things you could do to really kind of give your kidneys some love? I don't know, you know, to yeah. help your chi, chi flow if you are doing your practices. And that. The, a, a number of things. And obviously what you eat and drink has an impact, of course. Uh, but each cauldron affects the well-being of the other cauldrons. For example... If the upper cauldron is down and it's not enlightened and it's full of fear and anxiety, then your digestive system is going to shut down. Simple as that. So by being, it's very difficult to not be fearful. If you've been a fearful person and a stressed person, it's very difficult to not be. But what you can be is still. You can be silent. You know, so just being still and stopping and breathing slowly and then gradually make that a little lifestyle habit, you know, a few minutes every day and it will grow sort of thing. So the worrying mind can deplete the kidneys just as much as right. bad food and bad drink, you know, because mm. the kidneys, you know, the adrenals uh, are stimulated when you're worried and frightened. And that's going to drain your kidneys. Yeah. Other than that, then there's physicality. So, you know, warmth is really good for the kidneys, having a hot water bottle on your kidneys or, or making sure you don't get a cold draft on your kidneys, you know. OK. But they like to be warm and fluid, not cold. Right. So here's the thing then. So, um, mm, the world is passing from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius. Now, when that transition happens is up to debate. Um, but from star law perspective, Pisces, the current age or the last age, is the lower cauldron. Okay? So, and the Aquarius age, which is what we're transitioning into, is the middle cauldron. And that's worth meditating on. So for, for 2,000 years or so, we've, humanity as a whole, plant, the planet Earth, has been lower cauldron. And now there's this shift for the whole of the world and the planet of energy rising or focus rising from the lower cauldron to the middle cauldron. And, and it's going to be, you know, humanity and the world are going to be in the middle cauldron for the next 2,000 years or so. Well, that's a really interesting thing. There is a, a shift happening, but, it, you know, seeing it in that way is very intriguing, I think, you know, especially the way, uh, so like the middle cauldron is governed by the fire sign Leo, and Leo has a secondary constellation called Crater, which in Celtic lore is the cauldron, if you like. So the cauldron is actually in your middle mm -hmm. cauldron. You know, and there's another perspective. If you imagined all three cauldrons, 
and you drew a circle where the upper cauldron was at the top and the lower cauldron's at the bottom. So you've got a circle and in the middle of that circle is the middle cauldron. So the middle cauldron is like the nucleus inside an atom, if you like. You could see the lower cauldron and the upper cauldron as extensions of the middle cauldron, really, you know. So the middle cauldron is really where you are at. We all are. We're all at the center point. It's like E.T. with his heart light. That's kind of the middle cauldron. So um, whilst the middle cauldron is middle cauldron is the celestial middle cauldron with Leo the lion, we're also going into the age of Aquarius and the star law of that is Aquarius is pouring the water down to her opposite sign, which is Leo and the cauldron. So not only are we going from the age of the lower cauldron into the age of the middle cauldron, the star law is that bridey Brigid Brigantia is pouring her ever flowing waters into the cauldron in everyone's middle cauldron. Make of that what you will. But I mean, that, that's the star mm -hmm. law that we're living in. And, and our descendants will for the next 2000 years. You know, they're quite interesting. So when you're reading Celtic stories like Bran or Keridwen, look again at the cauldron and the metaphors that are being applied to that cauldron. Which one is it relating to, lower, middle, or upper? Or when you're standing under a tree and you're turning your thighs on, uh, just stand there peacefully, quietly, breathing slowly, and think about your middle cauldron being still. If you're spiraling downward into depression, uh, it's impossible to just be happy. You can't just be happy. It's like an escalator just going down, 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 down. It can't go up sort of thing. So if you're spiraling into depression or worry or anxiety and stuff, the first thing to do turning it around is to just be still. That, that's the magic of this, you know, the standing, just be still, just breathe slowly, just breathe slowly, just breathe slowly and be still. And if you can at least be still, then you can start to travel upwards and turn around and things, you know. Otherwise, you just keep spiralling down the rabbit hole to wherever, <laughs> what's at the bottom, you know. So, but the, the whole point of meditating is to find your inner balance and then from that turn your upper cauldron upwards and through that then you can connect with spirit connect with the land connect with the trees connect with the stars connect with the inner world you know all that stuff you can't do any of that stuff if you're spiraling down into fear and depression mm -hmm. what if um uh, what about pts i'm thinking about people with ptsd and, um, you know, it's like their body goes into that trauma response and it's in that fight or flight and they can't process any emotions or, or think about even how they're feeling. Their body is just buzzing. So would you recommend that for that as well? Do you think? When they've got, that? yeah, I mean, it's, it's so easy to say and hard to do, um, but someone with post-traumatic stress disorder, they've got so much internal noise going on mm. and that internal noise can be really erratic as well. Um, almost like apart from the obvious things like being in a better environment, a peaceful environment, having good friends around you, all those kind of things, you know, distraction is really good. You know, so, you know, I would, you know, from the tai, tai, learning Tai Chi or yoga or dance, uh, is a distraction you know anything that's rhythmic is going to help the body um, mm -hmm. but only if they can pull themselves away from all of their internal noise so first of all I think is stillness again and that might be mm -hmm. too difficult when they've got some internal noise so I would say um, yeah distraction and a healthy environment is what they need and, and an environment where they feel safe mm. Uh, which is easier said than done isn't it you know yeah 
uh, from a Chinese perspective, um, they, they have an idea of three types of qi. If you like, the first type of qi is what you're born with. We call it life force. It's what you get from your mum and dad, and it, it lives in your lower cauldron. And for most people, it lasts for about 80 years, and then you die. You know, your life force is burnt out, sort of thing. Mm. Um, so then the Taoists thought, well, how do we stop it running out? How do we have longevity? How do we keep topping it up so it doesn't run out? So the other two types of qi, then, to top it up and stop it running out are... One, food and drink. The right food and drink will keep topping you up and the wrong food and drink will deplete your energy. So mm -hmm. everyone knows what's good and bad for them sort of thing, you know, but it, it does come down to that. You've got your life force and then you've got the fuel you put inside you and it's going to help or hinder your longevity. Mm -hmm. The third type, at first it took me ages to understand the third type and, and the third type is your environment and i thought what, what are, you know, but, and at first of all well obviously doing tai chi under a tree is better than doing tai chi in a multi-story car park is that what they mean by uh, environment but actually it's all to do with your middle cauldron and vocation now your environment is everything in your life all the people that are around you that you spend time with day in, day out, that's your environment. And depending on the life you're living, the people around you can drain you, burn you out, hemorrhage your energy. Mm. And the right people around you can invigorate you and give you energy. It's as simple as that. So mm. it's that vocation thing. Are you where you should be? Are you living the life you should be doing? Are you being true to you? And all that stuff, it's so complicated, the middle cauldron. But if it's not content, the lower, bulk, lower cauldron digestive system is going to fail and, and the upper cauldron is going to be anxious and stressed and stuff. Mm. You know? So it's very tough, very, very tough. But I think the best you can do in all of that is just be still and, and then figure out where you go from there. Mm. You know? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I've been working on, on the tale of Branwyn, uh, looking at it like it's a fairy tale. And uh, I think uh, one of the major themes running through the tale of Branwyn is about post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's interesting that, it, that the, the book opens with uh, Metholic sailing over the sea to ask for Branwen's hand in marriage. And this takes us to the seventh house of the astrological wheel, which is the house of marriage and the open enemy. And it's the horizontal axis on the cross. The vertical axis is parental and the horizontal axis is, mar is um, self and other, self and other. And in the seventh house, marriage and the open enemy. So when when this marriage occurs, it's not a marriage of, of romance, it's a marriage of political expediency. And behind it, I think, dealing with cultural trauma between the two islands, right? They don't get along, but this marriage is supposed to create uh, an alliance. But because of unexamined trauma, uh, the character F. Nison, the stepbrother, right? And in fairy tales, the step the step character always has something twisted going on because of emotional wounds. And so if Nyson, you know, has all the symptoms of post-traumatic stress, he, he reacts to things in these horribly violent outbursts that inflict trouble. And it doesn't dawn on him that he's the source of the trouble, you know, because he's traumatized. So uh, I, I think that the story offers a lot. And, and then in the end, he has to jump into the cauldron it breaks the cauldron into four parts, which finally allows uh, not exactly a victory, but yeah, Bran, a disembodied head, is carried off the battlefield by seven. And uh, so seven is a, an interesting number because it goes back to the seventh house, which is the self and the other. And, and, and uh, a disembodied head is like the, the mind is no longer being distracted by the emotions, the, the internal battle of post-traumatic stress and cultural trauma. 
and uh, the four parts, you know, sounds, you know, it, it invokes the, the lower chakra, the root chakra has, has that cross. Um, uh, and, and also the cauldron uh, would be the therapeutic vessel. Uh, we can't just, uh, well, creative expression is the, is the ideal antidote to, to coping with this kind of trauma, creative expression. But you can't just talk about this in a bar. You take it into a, into a sacred vessel, which is a therapeutic vessel, where you'll find truth and understanding, the compassionate heart. And then creative expression is, is the, um, you know, the way of, of turning the trauma from wet, where it's active in the emotions, flaring up, creating the instinctual and unconscious trouble. You know, the trauma is coming back all the time the body down. These are like the zombies coming out of the cauldron. The zombies are thrown in, they come out, or the dead are thrown in and they come out as zombies. They can't talk, they're trauma, but they can still fight. They can still be, you know, reactive. But after the cauldron is broken into four, that, that's no longer an option. And that, that, that would be like, you know, coming out of the therapeutic vessel. A disembodied head is able to deal with the trauma just as narrative. And as a wounded healer, to be able to say, "Yes, I've been through this. And this is what this is what I went through, and this is how, you know, th these are the things that I did that are that are helping me. You know, it's no longer affecting me emotionally. I can look at it objectively from my head as a narrative, and literally, the narrative is you know part of the alchemical process, um, going back down to the wounds and creating the narrative. It sort of has a fairy tale ending. That's the what, what Tolkien said, the primary fairy tale is that it has a happy ending. That's really important. And that's that's sort of a key to alchemy. Really interesting insights. Yeah. Fascinating. Anne, were you wanting to talk? I was just going to ask about um, the body of light in relation to the energy sources with the I, I couldn't hear everything you were saying, but I think I picked. Uh -huh. I think I picked up the general gist of it. Um, each cauldron can have a negative effect on each of the other cauldrons, so a worried mind will create shut down the digestive system. Equally, uh, bad food and stuff can affect the mind as well. You know, mm -hmm. so it's quite interesting. That it is a bit like spinning plates. Uh, and so, again, with the standing exercise or just sitting meditating, you are just looking for peace and harmony. And even if it's just for two, three, four, five minutes, you're just holding those three cauldrons, one above the other, aligned and peaceful and balanced. And that therapy of just being still and focused. And, and then, you know, if you want to then be self-introspective or look at your own body and what might be going on for your health, energy and mind, you can focus on each cauldron, you know? So if it, if, if it is digestive issues or your body energy, it's lower cauldron, or if it's your emotional well-being, it's your middle cauldron, or if it's your mental anxiety and trauma, it's your upper cauldron, of course, you know? And, and it is worth, Although I've primarily talked about qigong and standing, when I first got the cauldron in my life, it was that a shamanic thing where we did lie on the floor with blankets and had drumming, and we did do shamanic journeys to each cauldron. And, and that's worth gold as well. It, it, it is. It is just worth doing a journey to your lower cauldron 
and just seeing it as an internal landscape and what it looks like and working with that, you know. And, and so you could have three different vision quests, one to each cauldron and stuff, you know. And, and acupuncture and reflexology and qigong give you great exercises and methods for just balancing out your energy, you know. Qigong can be like a firewall. So you've got your three cauldrons. They're like three cities in your kingdom, if you like. And uh, Qigong can be a firewall around all three so that you're no longer hemorrhaging energy. And, and that's like the positive side of being a closed thing. So it's the lower cauldron, the middle cauldron, that holding your middle cauldron for your own sanity and safety and firewall uh, and well-being and, and then when you are well and happy and content then it can open and you can do spirit journeys or, or whatever but, uh, again there's nothing wrong with it being down that, that idea that the cauldron is a protection brings us to the shield the, that that brand the alder is the shield. and and the cauldron has that quality as you just explained yeah when you were talking earlier, uh, you know, there is an idea that the cauldron is another metaphor for the cauldron is the sun's ecliptic or the year wheel, if you like. So when when the cauldron split into four piece, four pieces, that's like the four ache me of the Oem. <laughs> it's like, or four seasons of the year in a way, you know, natural division. Well, it seems to me and the called the middle cauldron being on its side because it's it's kind of mediating between the lower and the upper cauldrons and you want that flow so if you're habitually have that middle cauldron either pointing downward or pointing upward it, it's stagnant you know you're not getting the flow between your whole self so there's like a balance to the keeping that flexible and flowing yeah i think yeah or, or just that, the, you know, suffering and wisdom are connected. I thought that was worth mentioning that, that you know, suffering has so much to do with the, the cauldron facing down we're suffering. And, and if we can remember that suffering produces wisdom, that really changes it. If you can bring that into the, into your mind and your heart as you're suffering, it, it, it's a very helpful idea. I just wanted to put uh, put into uh, the cauldron as well the thought of um, the Vesica Pisces uh, from the chalice well, which mm -hmm. is also the three cauldrons in a way, which which are in it. And another thing I really can't help but it wants to be spoken out is the the idea of the drinking horn. Uh, from the Germanic um, uh, idea, uh, the outer rear, the, the, I think you know what I mean, the outer rear, the myth, the myth. And uh, I think inspiration for me, inspiration always comes from a point of total stillness. So when you are very still, then a, a good and beautiful idea can arise. Uh, and it's always this lake this silent deep lake where the surface is totally still when when things get up and um, come come into into life in a way i have a how, how is it called the the little animal it's it's flying around here all the time the uh, a buck uh, the red one with the black dots how do you call it ladybug Yes, I have a ladybug here. <laughs> it's crawling along my face. I don't know, maybe it wants to tell us something. Do you see it? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Very sweet. Yeah. They are wind they are wintering here in my space. Yeah. This is what I want just wanted to share. <laughs> Another image that comes from the story that that's worth mentioning is if Nyson throws the little child named Alder into the fire, and this is like the culmination of the tragedy. Uh, Brenwin doesn't recover from that, but but the the Alder didn't you say that 
it is a, a very dry wood and it's light and dry. And I would think being dry, it, it, you know, there is something about the fire um, mm -hmm. that the alder would be attracted to the fire, but also the emotional, uh, the, the, wherever the wound is, the inner child is constellated. And to throw that into the fire, to take it into the alchemical vessel. And so, uh, and, and, and that is sort of like a, a big turning point for Nyson, right? After, after that happens, the whole battle erupts and he ends up throwing himself into the cauldron or pl playing dead to go into the cauldron. And that's the end of F. Nyson, I understand, if I understand correctly. So this, this twisted emotional um, part of the self goes into the cauldron, but it also mm. took the emotional child and threw it into the fire, which is like bringing it into the light mm. and, and putting an end to, 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 the, to the fear and, and childishness that, that might be connected to it. Um, Lily just put in the chat, I find it fascinating that neurons have been found in your gut and your heart. It was very interesting. The, the Chinese uh, word for the middle cauldron is xin. It's spelled X-I-N in English, uh, xin. And that translates as heart mind. It's really interesting. Heart mind, as opposed to mental mind, it's your heart mind. And again, that's your your emotional soul journey stuff, your vocation. Are you true to your heart mind? Um, a woman that I investigate, uh, she died in 1961. She was an occultist, a lady called Catherine Maltwood, and she was a sculptor. And in 1922, she did a statue called the Holy Grail. And the Holy Grail statue doesn't have a chalice or a cup or anything grailish about it and what it is it's a figure standing like this and at the heart it's doing that mm. and she called that the holy grail in 1922 you know understanding that it was shin or heart mind or the celestial cauldron with leo the lion in the heart center of everybody the amazing stuff you know but yeah the the body has uh, intelligence throughout the body, not just in the brain. There's a funny saying that the brain is the most important organ of the body, says the brain. <laughs> <laughs> and the, um, Chinese, the Chinese don't rate it very highly, actually. The pineal gland's important, but all the gray stuff around the pineal gland, they call it the sea, as in ocean, the sea of matter. You know, it's the sea of matter around the pineal gland. And the thing is that from a Taoist perspective, you are yin and you are yang. And the yin that you are is your physicality, your physical self. And the yang that you are is your non-physical self. You know, that's the yin and yang. And so the brain, as with the rest of your bones and your flesh and your tendons, is perishable. You know, it's not going to last. Whereas your heart mind, your glowing ET heart light is your eternal self, you know? So that your shin, your heart mind, your middle cauldron is the core of your spirit and your eternal being. Whereas the brain is just your computer that will perish. You know, it will perish. Mm. I think there's... Um definitely for me there's a lot of the space in between coming you know where you've got the line down and the middle cauldron facing out um for me like my connection with nature comes from my heart yeah and so I really feel it through my heart and so it's also like you're receiving into that cauldron which then can feed the rest of you because you're part of that anyway you know you're all part of the same thing um but also that facing out there's so much like in between so if you're looking at the cross um of the seasons and then you're looking at that in the middle and that can face either way to each of those points yeah and i feel like that in between in the in between of the breath the in between of everything is that place of all knowledge and no knowledge 
And when Franklin was talking about earlier, he said something that really reminded me of that as well. Um, and the yew tree as well at winter solstice, those three days at each of those points, the that in between, hill. that's everything and nothing, you know. I think the middle um, cauldron is that because it really yeah. is holding the middle space between this world and the spirit world. That's if it. You like. The balance. It is. It's, <laughs> it's, that, that's what it is. And um, yeah. when we talked about post-traumatic stress disorder or if it's turned down and it's ups upset and, and broken, what's interesting is it responds to kindness and love. Mm. So other people's love and kindness can turn the middle cauldron upwards, you know? So it just shows you how heart, mind, emotional it is, this cauldron of vocation. Stuff. In astrology, the fifth house is the house of vocation and it's ruled by Leo. And it's <laughs> creativity and play. The Kabbalistic tree of life, it's Tifereth. You know, it's the sun at the heart center. With it, and Leo is governed by the sun as well. So it's all the same. You know, you think it's the same wisdom all over the world. That's why it comes up again and again, because we're talking about the human being, which is not just a physical, historical entity. The human being uh, probably comes from the star, our sun, and the earth, the womb of the sun. So just to conclude things then, so... The actual Celtic manuscript, the Irish manuscript from the 15th century, you'll find it online. Just Google the Cauldron of Posey. And that's the, trans that's the first translation that was done in English by someone called Annie Power. And it is very sparse. It's about four pages. So you can go and look at it and you'll appreciate then how it's really interesting. There are some insights there, but it doesn't tell you how to work with the three cauldrons or how to develop them. So I think this talk at least shows you that you can look to many different cultures and bring them all together to look at ideas of how to work with the three cauldrons. And I think that global universality is really special. For me, that's the Aquarian age, you know, and the three cauldrons could bring lots of systems together, you know, because it's all one song. The idea that our instincts were stored outside our body in order to give this incredible plasticity to our brains. These instincts were stored outside our bodies in vessels called fairy tales and myths. So it's really good to study these things because they contain images that talk the language of the soul, the language of a part of us that's immortal, it keeps coming back again and again and again. That has to be awoken. Because it, it, it's surely not coming out in our modern culture, which is very materialistic. It's at that Piscean stage of materialism, but the egg's about to break. We're about to you know, recover the power of myth and fairy tale, which is uh, recovering the fact that we're actually divine spirit that comes into the world again and again and again with a body and a soul. The soul, potentially mortal, can also transform itself into an immortal. This is this is the gist of the, of the story. Uh, the key word key word is love as well because it's the middle cauldron that loves those stories. Yeah. You know why are so many people drawn to the legends of King Arthur? There is a love there, even if they don't know all the stories that there are. They're drawn to it. They're pulled to it. Stuff, and for whatever reason, people are pulled to the Celtic stories. You know, so Branwen is the daughter of Lear. Lear is the sea. She's the daughter of the sea, which is the emotional water element. And she's the goddess of love. And she's suffering in this story. She's going through a tragedy because she's at that point in the stage when apocalypse is about to happen. An old world is gonna be you know, pulled apart and everybody's gonna die. But this is, the, this is what has to happen when we're gonna transform, when we're possessed by malignancy, we go into the cauldron and transform to emerge as a new being that has, you know, restored themselves to the world. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. So, I mean, at some future point, we could do a, one on the lower cauldron and, and just get deeper into each one. Um, but we've got the 
the Zoom for Willow coming up next week. So I don't want to keep banging out Zoom sessions. I think it's good to wait a, a few weeks between them and stuff, mm. you know. But um, okay. yeah, I, I think it is worth doing just one on the middle cauldron, one on the upper cauldron and stuff. Uh. Okay. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Yuri. I'll, I'll thank put you. this on YouTube in the next hour or so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.